So right now, there's about 100 congressional offices that are already using AI. And they're doing it for everyday tasks like writing correspondence, uh, handling member scheduling. They're also doing things like drafting legislation. Hey everybody, I'm Brad Bussey, Chief Information Security Officer here at E360. Thank you for joining me for the State of Enterprise IT Security Edition. This is the show that makes IT security approachable and actionable for technology leaders. I'm happy to bring you three topics this week. The first one, uh, Vonti patches zero days and confirms some new exploits. Second, the U.S. says that it disrupted a China cyber threat, but warns hackers could still wreak havoc on U.S. businesses. And third, Congress confronts security risks as it seeks to expand its use of AI on what they call the Hill. So with that, let's get started. So the first topic, uh, Avanti has patched a couple of zero days but while they were doing that, they confirmed several new exploits. So I know a lot of our listeners out there are Ivanti customers. And for those of you that don't know what the company does, it's, think of it as VPN. They also do a, a patching service. If you're familiar with uh, some of the older Pulse Secure uh, technology, think, it, think of it that way. So the idea is when you're using something like this, it is to establish a virtual private network or you are trying to securely patch and deliver some software. And you can imagine when there's vulnerabilities and that kind of stuff, it can make for a bad day when it comes to an enterprise. So three weeks ago, a digital forensics firm, Velexity, they spotted the exploitation I think we're going to be talking a little bit about China today because it was a Chinese government backed APT hacking team. And what it impacted was the secure access client for Avanti, uh, the remote device management, and the remote policy management. Now, what's interesting is Avanti was aware of this before they publicly talked about it but it was for 20 companies that were impacted. And then Mandiant, being Mandiant, came and said, you realize that this is broadly exploited and it's broadly exploited activity. And they came and said, we looked back and this has actually been happening since December 3rd of 2023. So quite a bit longer than than anybody has really been talking about. Now, when I look at this, I'm thinking, what, what is the actual risk? Mainly, it's this hacker group installing things like crypto miners, stealing information, and installing backdoors. So you're probably wondering, well, how, how are they doing that with these exploits? So the issues, I'll, I'll give you a couple just so you can frame it, because I think this is important even outside of Avanti. There are ways of bypassing authentication. So you, you've heard me talk a lot about multi-factor authentication, making sure we have several factors of authentication and authorization. But when you can bypass that stuff, that's kind of a scary thing. So one of these vulnerabilities is a bypass technique. And if I were to rank it as far as severity, it's like an eight out of a 10. You could argue, could be a nine. It it's it's kind of I'd say more of an eight. The next one though, it's a command injection vulnerability. And you can inject some interesting payloads into the web component of the Avanti Secure. And it goes into uh, the policy engine as well. And this allows for crafting of requests and allows you to execute commands as an administrator. So, this one is like a 9 out of 10 or even a 10 out of 10, mainly because as an admin, you can do a heck of a lot. 
The one before, it was authentication. It was bypassing. But if your user is relatively unprivileged, then it's still a problem, but it's not as bad as somebody coming in as an admin and being able to do pretty much whatever they want. Next vulnerability that was detected was a, a forgery a vulnerability around SAML. And that just allowed them to get access to some restricted resources within the platform. And then there was a, another privilege escalation inside of the web component. And again, that's another one that's, that's pretty high up there, about a, a nine out of 10 when it comes to severity. Good news, there's CVEs out for this. If you're hearing this for the first time and you have Avanti, definitely take a look at what those CVEs contain, how to patch, what to do, and that will definitely uh, help keep you out of, uh, out of danger. So the second thing I wanna talk about today is it's another uh, China cyber threat, a Chinese cyber threat. And this one is interesting because it is targeting our critical infrastructure. And the way they're doing it is interesting, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So what, what is critical infrastructure? That's like power plants, water treatment, transportation, communication. And why is a nation state like China doing this? It, if any of you, if you haven't seen this movie, I would suggest it. Most people have Netflix. Uh, the movie's called Leave the World Behind. And in that movie, it actually explains why a lot of this stuff happens. Because if, if you're going to potentially go to war with another nation, uh, destabilizing the civilian infrastructure, spreading propaganda, cutting off communications, these are all core tenants to uh, really making some, some issues at home that a military would more than likely need to step in and therefore be unavailable for that kind of a, a war front somewhere else. So I know it's kind of weird to think of, but there's a reason why the nation states do the things that they do, because they're, they're either doing it to get ready for something or in most cases, they're doing it just in case. They want to make sure that if they need to destabilize us or another nation, they have a path forward. I don't like talking about it, but it is, it is a fact. And that, that really brings me to a second point. I don't think we hear enough about this. There are things that happen from a national security perspective that we as civilians, we just we don't hear about. And this kind of stuff happens all the time. So the way that the threat or attack group is masking what they're doing is they're targeting small offices, home businesses, home systems, routers, endpoints, and they're trying to cover their tracks with local IP addresses or local systems. And they're pulling them together into a botnet and they're spreading malware across all of these different systems. So if you're thinking about this and you're, you're wondering, like, how can, how can we help? So if you're thinking about this at home or, or even if you are on a corporate network, some of the core tenets of, of security that we've talked about before, they, they still hold true, even for stuff at home. Making sure your passwords are changed, you're using a password manager, you're doing multi-factor authentication wherever you can. That's just good hygiene. Updating your router firmware, if you have a more complex network, making sure that firmware and security patching, if it's available, is updated across the enterprise, super important. Keeping systems patched, so if you like to ignore and say, I'll do it later, I'll do it later, uh, when you get those little pop-ups at home, or if it is in an office setting, I think we have a different conversation to have, but if it is at home, consider taking the time to do it. There's a very good reason why uh, those updates are being pushed. And my suggestion is don't be part of the problem. So if you can do some of these firmware updates, patching, it'll help keep you from joining these botnets that are really 
going to cause a problem and have caused a problem in the past. There are a lot of routers now that have security suites, and typically they're not free, but they're not really that expensive either. And what they do is they look for intrusions, they look for odd behavior, they look for one of your own systems that may have been impacted or infected with something. And when it's trying to go out and communicate with a botnet or it's trying to communicate, uh, you've got some kind of a command and control situation going on, your network will actually tell you, hey, this is not normal, this is not good. And then you can take action against it. So again, if there is something that you can do as far as patching, do it. And if you have firewall settings that you don't understand on your home system, ask somebody. Because in most instances, things coming into your network are blocked, but there are cases where there are ports and things that are open that shouldn't be, that somebody could walk through with you and, and say what should be and what shouldn't be. So the third thing I wanna talk about today is Congress. They're confronting security risks and it's seeking to expand the use of AI on the Hill. So I'm gonna talk about the House and I'm gonna talk about the Senate. I promise this will not be United States government class because I didn't do super well in that either. But what I will talk about is how the House and the Senate are approaching this a little bit differently. So right now, there's about 100 congressional offices that are already using AI. And they're doing it for everyday tasks like writing correspondence, uh, handling member scheduling. They're also doing things like drafting legislation or they're taking a bill, they're feeding it into a one of these AIs, I'll talk about a couple of them, and they're getting a summary because sometimes these things are hundreds of pages and a congressman, congresswoman, they just want to know what, uh, what, does this, what is this actually talking about? So I found it interesting. I mean, there's like 200 staffers, 150 house uh, officers. They're actually piloting. And, it's, and you've heard me talk about open AI and chat GPT before. But they are, they are piloting chat GPT, they call it plus, but it's more of the, the Teams version now because uh, it's got privacy components. So the house, they were considering Google Bard. They were considering Microsoft Copilot. But interestingly, at the time, only OpenAI was, they were the only one, the only company to come out and say, you know, we're committed to protecting the house and the member data, and we'll make sure that the data is private and won't be used to train their model. So that was a big selling point. So now they are all piloting uh, ChatGPT and leveraging it. So why are they doing this? Very similar to why enterprises are doing this too. They wanna ease workloads. They wanna take some of the burden off of arguably overburdened staffers today. They want to help with research. They, they want to write more consistent bills that look like they are being written by uh, the same person. And again, I said this, they want to summarize some of the things that they're reading, and then they want to extend their outreach capabilities. So I think a big piece of this is they want to build staff capacity and they wanna do that without expanding payroll. So this should sound pretty familiar to enterprises. You know, we keep talking about, are these AIs going to replace people? I don't think so. I think what it is, is it's, it's not artificial intelligence, it's augmented intelligence. So Congress themselves, they're saying that AI won't replace humans. It's just gonna make them better. So therefore, that augment statement, I feel they think is true as well. And this is kind of funny because typically Congress, if you look at how they've embraced technology over time, they've generally been lagging. Like how long did it take for them to embrace email? And I remember in 2006, listening to a congressperson 
talk about the internet and describe it as a series of tubes. And I, I, I still chuckle at that because it's a very interesting way of describing uh, how the internet is all put together. So in this, what should we be worried about? I think some of them are obvious. There's some national security risks depending on what's being shared and how private that information really is. Is AI going to be leveraged for anything sensitive or involving personal information? And the thing that I'm a little more focused on is the attackers are already leveraging these same tools. We're going to see a lot of this during the election this year. So I think there needs to be more focus on that. And, and I'll get to that in just a second. And then another thing that I would be worried about, and we haven't talked much about this in the past, is there's a thing called hallucinations. And AIs can hallucinate, and they can be pretty convincing when they're wrong about something. So you ask them a question, maybe it's something that there's not a lot of data on, or it just misunderstands the question completely. It's like a person. It's like me on a conference call, and I'm actually you know, maybe thinking about something else. I'm looking over, and then I hear, hey, Brad, what do you think about that? And I don't want to embarrass myself, but I'm about to embarrass myself. And I just pontificate on what I think I just heard. And then often I'm corrected as, what are, we're not even talking about that right now. So uh, anyway, that's, that's something interesting for uh, listeners, because I'm sure we've all done it, where somebody asks us a question, we just go off on something else because we totally weren't paying attention. But AIs have that same challenge. And when they hallucinate, they can give you wrong information. So I think that's something where how are we going to check the information that we're getting from an AI and make sure that it is actually good. So what is, what is Congress doing? Uh, they're actually building guardrails for AI use. Uh, the House Chief Admin Office they're expected in the next two to three months, they're going to unveil a draft policy for AI use across the House. Now, I promised I would talk a little bit about the Senate, and they're being way more careful, and they're adopting AI much slower. And really, it's only being leveraged for research and eval purposes. So only non-sensitive information. And the, the top cybersecurity officials in the chamber, they've determined, you know, OpenAI, uh, ChatGPT, Google Bard, Microsoft Copilot, they stand really a moderate level of risk to the Senate if, and this is a big if, controls are actually followed. So when it comes to the upper levels of the government and the Senate, they're definitely being a little more careful. So it, it's something to watch. And I think we will all see this unfold over the next couple of months and over the next year. So with that, thanks for joining me and we'll see you next time.